I'll be waiting. Let me know if uh, when when's a good time to start. Now, all right. Hello, everybody. My name is Luis Ubieta. I'm a lead firmware engineer at Croxel, and I'm here to present an open source contribution I recently made to the Zephyr project, which is among some of the things most relevantly uh, shell over Bluetooth LE. So let's go over some of the agenda uh, today. We'll do a quick intro, then we go over some gen general aspects about Bluetooth low energy in a nutshell. Then we'll touch upon the basis upon which shell over Bluetooth is it's built upon, um, which is you of a Bluetooth LE news. Then we touch on what Zephyr shell is. And essentially, we explain how to use shell over Bluetooth LE, and we do a live demo. We'll make sure to leave some time for asking questions. So I know not only you guys are here, but also this is live stream. If you want to ask some questions in the chat, we'll make sure to try to get to all of them if possible. So quick intro about myself. I studied electrical engineering, even though ever since I graduated from college, I gravitated towards software. Uh, it's one of my passions. So that uh, got me to be the lead firmware engineer at Croxel today. I've been around seven years writing firmware um, and introducing bugs as well. <laughs> um, I'm based in Melbourne, Florida, the Space Coast. Everybody always asks me, is that in Australia? It is, it is not, it's in Florida. Um, the other thing about the Space Coast, if you see that nice picture over there, is that we have rocket launches every other week. So SpaceX is always deploying satellites and it's like part of the scenery of the area. It's pretty common to see them. Um, I have passion for technology, electronics, and IoT. Uh, my first separate contribution was in 2021. On my free time, when I'm not coding or doing engineering, I like, I'm into fitness and sport. I recently published, a, I started a blog that's called embeddedtails.blog, and I have a series about Zephyr called Zephyr, the Linux for MCUs. So make sure to stay tuned if, if you're interested in it. And nevertheless, uh, this is my first time as an uh, embedded open source summit speaker, so please bear with me. <laughs> about Croxel. So what we do is primarily we are a team of engineers who develop firmware and design hardware for companies. So we do consulting and contracting. We have expertise in Zephyr um, and we essentially kind of like typically assist clients and people who have needs that need to run on Zephyr. Um, we offer different services from end-to-end -end product development capabilities. Also we do rapid prototyping and obviously, we also do, we're also open to uh, team augmentation. So a typical use case where a team has a, a product or has a uh, development they need to do, but they don't have the expertise to do that, we usually team up with them and work in collaboration to get it done. And finally, we are active in the Zephyr project community, so we provide contributions as part of what we do. So this is about the contribution. What's the status of this? So we published a PR um, around beginning of March, and it got a few iterations that ended up being a more generalized Bluetooth low energy transport for UART. Initially, it was positioned as shell over Bluetooth LE, but we found out short along the way that there was a lot more value in making it more generalized so it runs over UART and we can tap onto everything that UART is already um, developed for in the code base of Zephyr. So that's why um, that's, that's, uh, that was pivoted from that. The status is it's that it's merged. I see a couple people here in the room who approve and review the PR. Appreciate uh, your comments and review on it. And it, finally, uh, one of the things that I believe are interesting is that it faces a long-standing issue that was open since 2019 that wanted to get this done, so. Okay, so let's go over Bluetooth LE in a nutshell. I just touch it on an overview, so I don't, um, I don't skip it, but I'm sure you guys might be familiar with this concept, so. Um, Bluetooth in a nutshell, essentially, when you have uh, devices that want to talk to each other, they need to find themselves. They need to be aware of their presence. And the way Bluetooth LE does that is uh, by the generic access profile, the gap profile, in which, in general terms, obviously, there are some, um, um, there, there are some uh, specific cases, but 
in general terms, the peripherals advertise packets to the, uh, essentially kind of like broadcast and signal its surroundings that it's, it's there, right? And you can put some information in those broadcast packets. And the central devices, such as like mobile phones, computer, and other things, generally more powerful are scanning for these devices to obviously want it to connect or interact with them, right? So the gap profile it takes care of that. Uh, peripheral devices are generally more low power devices, such as wearables or embedded control devices that are more restricted. That's not that, that there could be exceptions, but that's generally the case. And once you have them connected, you establish um, one typical way to do that is you, you go to the gap profile in which establishes the scheme or the way that the two devices that are part of the connection can interact. So generally speaking, you have a, um, the peripheral who is like the GAT server and exposes a GAT database, exposes like profile, a profile implementing services and characteristics, which in general terms is just a endpoints through which you can interact in a specific manner, define what by what the profile does and what are the rules for it. And the, the central is the client. So essentially it's like uh, getting the information from the peripheral and exchanging um, and, and setting commands, receiving information and whatnot. This picture here is an example, typical like a wearable that has like a heart rate monitor and the client is a mobile phone that wants to consume that information for whatever purpose you might want to. So what happens, oh, so I'll, I'll go quickly back just to make one clarification. The Bluetooth spec has some uh, standardized gap profiles, right? You have like heart rate, um, you got like battery monitoring service, among other things. Generally, people run into the problem of uh, well, should I use standardized GAT, uh, GAT profiles or should I do custom ones? Cause, because you can, right? Um, generally, the, the trend or the question you need to answer is if you want uh, compatibility across different applications. The way to go with the standard GAT uh, profiles are is, is that you um, want different applications to, be, to understand what you want to do. Or if something fits your purpose, why not use it, right? In general terms, that is okay, but it could be that you don't find something that is already standardized. So that's when you run into custom GATs. Um, and there are many ways in which you can implement this uh, custom GAT services and, or custom GAT profile. Um, one of the options is to go with a Bluetooth-centric GAT. So what does that mean? Essentially, you're building the profile in terms of the functionality of the device or the functionality that you want to expose. Here in the picture, we can see, for instance, like one characteristic per functionality. Let's say that you have one for button state, another one for LED control. That's what the LBS uh, service from Nordic does, right? They, they, you expose the ability to understand what the digital input is and, and obviously command control the output of another one. Another example is what's there on the picture uh, that you have. Let's say I want to have a motion detection service, right? Or a profile, which consists of a single service, motion service, and you have like different characteristics. One for the motion state. Let's say that you have like a, an integer signaling whether you're moving or not. Another one, would you specify the motion location? So it may be a wearable and you may wear it as a necklace or you may have it as a, as a worn, wristband worn device, right? Um, you can also have like a motion count. So you have to keep track of the number of events that have like transition between moving or staying idle. And you can obviously control it. Let's say uh, you, you want it enable, you want to disable, or you want it in a specific mode. That's also possible. This is typically the way that standard Bluetooth LE services are structured on, exposing the functionality so that applications can understand what's happening. The other approach would be to keep it generic, as generic as possible. So in that sense, essentially, you're just exposing the GAD, um, uh, the GAD service and, and the characteristics in such a way that you are just putting the endpoints or the ports, and then essentially the meaning of that information will be determined by the content of that payload. In this case, that is generic. There is no insight of what is going on with the application will be the payload, as I've already mentioned. And um, basically, you generally have to come up with a schema to parse and encode that, those commands. The benefit of this, even though it's not the way that Bluetooth LE generally works is that you can have it as one of the main uh, of the different transport of a specific um, application or services you're providing. Let's say you have it um, a transport. Um, you, you have a functionality that goes over UART, and you have another one that goes over I don't know um, an IP protocol, and then you want BLE as well for that. So that would be one option in which Bluetooth is one of the 
back ends of, of, what, of the service you're trying to provide. Sounds a lot like zero, um, where you, for instance, you may have like a transmission characteristic and you may have like a reception characteristic and essentially you just want for transferring data and the one for, for receiving. And that's what brings us to your word over Bluetooth LE, news. Um, I'll talk about what NUS is. Essentially, it's a custom service. It's uh, NUS stands for Nordic Keyword Service. That was a company who developed and came up with this service. And uh, um, essentially, as I mentioned, it does exactly what I just described before, where you have like a transmission characteristic where you can send data and you have it a reception characteristic from which you can receive data as well. It's similar to what the serial port profile does in Bluetooth Classic. And it's, uh, I, I need to mention that this is not standardized. So this is a custom service. I understand there were efforts to standardize it, but they didn't get through. Even though that's the case, uh, it is widely used in Bluetooth LE applications. So if in the past you have tried to do something about a serial port or Bluetooth LE, chances are you've run into this. Um, so the way to enable it on Zephyr is basically, among different things, one of the uh, important aspects in Zephyr is that we have it abstracted behind you, the UART driver. So you, not only you can interact it as a Bluetooth LE API with a service, but you can treat it as a UART device. And what that allows you to do, as you guys can see on the picture, is that you can declare it and, and I would say instantiate it on the device tree. So it's like I have a serial device with the compatible property of Zephyr news UART, as you can see there in the tree. And the benefit for that is not only you can have multiple instances, as in a device tree may have, you have multiple UART ports or UART devices you can pipe data through, but also you can redirect subsystems that should be compatible with UART to be uh, routed through the Bluetooth LE as well. So um, here is like one simple demo we can do. Blinky with the console routed over Bluetooth LE. Um, I'm gonna try to do this live, hope it, it goes all right. And uh, this, the command for doing that essentially is just, we define a board, a target, and we provide a snippet. Essentially a snippet makes it easy for uh, linking what needs to, be, needs to happen on the device tree alongside with kernel configurations or project configurations. And, and it's available in the tree there. So we'll go ahead and, and, and build this. Uh, samples, basic Blinky, we'll erase it and we'll use a Python application, essentially any client that you might come up with that's compatible with it to see how it works. Hopefully this will turn out all right. I hope you guys, can you see my screen? Okay. Let me clear this, clear this, I oh, will. So, we provide the snippet, and then we say what application we want to build for. Let's see, I just tried this a minute, a few minutes ago, but hopefully, okay. Seems to go all right. I have here a development kit wired up. Just, just one FYI, I see some pictures being taken of the slides. They're available on the schedule, uh, so you could continue to take them, but just uh, they're, they will be available for you guys. So I'm gonna flash it right now. I just failed, let me try again. Oh, that's really nice. Uh, let me see what's going on. So this is obviously the onboard tailing that's in here. Obviously, it's an emulator. If you have like a jailing dedicated for it, it sh this shouldn't happen, but in any case, we got it through. So right now, what I'm gonna do is I'll open a new tab and let's go with a client. Essentially, I have here one scripts, uh, Bluetooth CLI. This is just a Python application and let's see. As you can see, this is not connected over um, UART, even though we have here the USB and it has like, it, it is essentially kind of this uh, scanning for the devices. The, um, the, the board is broadcasting with a new service. The computer is finding it, it's connecting it, it's subscribing to the characteristic to receive data and you're getting that. Uh, so you have like a uh, console over Bluetooth LE. That's one of the benefits for this. Okay. Um, uh, let's continue. So th that was good. Let's talk about the Zephyr shell then, um, which is 
uh, generally like going to this part of the presentation, uh, we make a lot of emphasis on how useful and important Zephyr, uh, the shell subsystem is for Zephyr. And there are many reasons for that. Um, one of them is that it has extensive support in, tree, in the tree. So essentially, the shell, as you guys may know, it's like a command line interface that, uh, in which you can define and implement commands in a, like, essentially kind of like command response basis to execute some actions or query some, some information. Um, and uh, just going over a little bit of the generalities for this is you can define custom commands and use them in a pretty simple manner on the firmware side, and uh, you can use the commands that are already there in the tree, which is a lot of them. We'll, we'll go over those. The way to define a command if you want to implement a shell command for your application, essentially, you have two options, two general options. There are like different permutations, and you can have like some, some complications, but keeping it simple, um, you have the ability to register a shell command in which you define the syntax. Essentially, what is the command? What do you want to execute, right? Then you uh, have the ability to provide subcommands. So basically, not only the command, but some variations of that. Um, you have some a, a, a help string just to provide guidance on how should the command be used, or what are the arguments, what are the expectations that the that the command expects, so the user can um, use it in an intuitive manner. In, intuitive manner. And finally, a command handler. So this is the function that gets executed when the command is detected to be issued, right? If additionally, this is too limited for you, you want to provide arguments to that shell command, you can do so by using this other macro. Well, you have the, where you have the, the shell command argument. Additionally to whatever, uh, every, everything I said before, you have two additional arguments. One of the mandatory arguments, the number of uh, arguments that are supposed to be mandatory, and the other one for optional arguments. The function handler, this is pretty general, but uh, in, um, in a, in a bas basic and fundamental view, with the, the, the way you would use uh, or implement a function uh, with, uh, with shell would be just to receive the, the, the argument count and argument value. So this will be provided as strings, uh, as an array of strings. Uh, um, and essentially, you just validate the inputs, make sure that uh, the, it matches your expectations. You execute the function that it's meant to, meant to be uh, implemented or executed, and then you just return a uh, result. Um, additionally, you may provide like some context or information as you're executing this function in a print K uh, fashion using the shell print um, um, API. Essentially, you can say if there was an error, what was the error? So you can provide some description of what happened if something went wrong or if if it didn't, or if you needed to provide a feedback, a result, or a value, that that's that's how you would do it. So going right now, like tying all the loose ends, I already explained what Bluetooth LE was. I explained how to how to map it uh, like a E word um, over Bluetooth LE and how to take take it into advantage for the different different subsystems. But generally, um, in 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 true, like the Zephyr shell has uh, different backends, right? The first one would be like the serial, in which you can uh, use it for UART, USB, or BLE. You could have RTT, which is right over JLink, if you wanted to. You can have a RP message for interprocessor communication, right? So that can be implemented. MQTT, Telnet, and MCU Manager. So uh, we've mentioned that. Uh, um, the commands and uh, shell commands and Zephyr have extensive support, and that is not uh, an overstatement. There, are literally, all over the pieces of code, you have uh, shell commands for the different drivers and subsystems, and this is not an exhaustive list of them. As an example, you can use shell commands to control the I2C device, I2C devices. You can control um, ADC, GPIO for rating and setting uh, digital input and output, PWM, CAN bus. Flash, sensors, and LoRa. One typical example, for instance, of how this would be useful would be when you have like a board and you want to validate some of the components, but you don't really have code for it. It's just a one-off basis type validation, and you can like issue I squared C commands manually to see if the devices are there. Or you just like perform an I squared C scan, control GPIO pin, so you just set an output to enable a regulator or some other thing, right? You may be interested in interacting with or just literally reading the, some sections of the flash, right? Those typical uses. For subsystems, you have more commands, uh, more shell commands like Bluetooth, uh, audio, networking, 
anything you might come up with or you might be thinking in terms of like Wi-Fi commands, Ethernet, or IP-based protocols, you probably have shell commands for that. Um, MCU boot, logging, storage file systems, and LLEXT as well. So, ton of commands, probably miss a couple of them, but just a general picture, shell is uh, tightly coupled or tightly in, in one of the core foundations of what uh, uh, Sefer is offering, so make sure you can use it if, if, you, if you want to. Finally, we now um, tie everything together. Where, okay, so I'm interested, I want to try shell over Bluetooth LE, how do I do this, right? So it's generally a two-step two configuration. Uh, where first of all, you make sure you have the key configs to enable the relevant modules that you want to interact with. And that's like kind of like um, zero, you need to enable zero, um, you enable the shell, and you enable Bluetooth plus uh, news. Additionally, we have some optional configurations which may be useful for you. Um, the first one is about auto enabling Bluetooth. So if you're running an application that does not really handle Bluetooth on its own, and you just want to try it, let's say like a uh, the, the Blinky sample I just showed doesn't really enable uh, Bluetooth, right? So by enabling this configuration, it'll auto start, like a system MD type thing. Um, and finally, some throughput optimizations, but uh, just a disclaimer, it's not a one size fits all type thing. Your application may have different needs and it's important that you keep that in mind. And the other part is the device tree. Now, the device tree, just as, as I mentioned before, you, the, you instantiate the node, the device tree node, to be compatible with Zephyr News UART. You additionally, so internally, that implementation has like a RX and TX FIFO sizes, so you may have different endpoints with different constraints. Maybe this one doesn't need that many, uh, that, that many bytes of, of FIFO, and you can optimize that for your application. That's perfectly feasible. And you essentially just write the chosen property for uh, Sephir Shell UART. I want to redirect that to BT News Shell UART, which is the node label in the instantiated node in this case. So let's go with a live demo. Uh, I think uh, you guys all been uh, waiting all along for this. Let's see, does it even work? <laughs> um, for this demo, I'm going to be using one of our um, Proxel prototyping boards. This is like a BLE node uh, that we have open sourced. Uh, essentially, it's a um, it's a Nordic. It's got a Nordic chipset inside of it. Uh, is really like an Azure layered uh, BL654, uh, and it's got a ton of sensors. Essentially, you have like a, an accelerometer, you have like a um, uh, ambient light and RGB color sensor, temperature, pressure, humidity. So it, it was one of the sensors that we developed when we were playing and wanted to prototype for low power applications. Um, the source for the, um, the design files for this, it's available on this link on croxsoul.com slash BLE. Just to, not to distract uh, the meeting, but just like, hey, this is the schematic for the peripherals. Everything is mostly tied over I2C. You have a bunch of I2C peripherals that you can talk to, including um, uh, everything I just mentioned. I think I didn't miss anything. But it, it has, for instance, uh, a Hall effect switch, so you can use a magnet with it to detect the presence of it or not, and among other things. This is on the slides and it's on the website as well. So um, let's go with the demo that we promised. Uh, let me go over here. So what I'm gonna do, it's I'm going to, hopefully I have the command saved here. If not, I have to type it myself. Okay, so here um, we are building for, uh, can I, let me clear the screen. And let me show the command again. Okay, so what this command does is builds an application uh, for the CX1825. Uh, That's the board, uh, and it's got a RF 5240. And uh, we are targeting the sample subsys shell shell module. That's the shell sample. Um, addition on top of that, we are providing the kconfig overlays, the project configuration overlays, and the, the DTS overlays. Uh, these are overlays. Um, dash bt.conf and bt.overlay. And we're enabling a bunch of subsystems so that we can play with them here on the demo. Oh. If you're not familiar with this syntax, essentially after the sample, you can provide some flags so that uh, you can, on a one-off basis, can include some additional components for you to play with. But that's not permanent. As, as soon as you erase the build directory, it'll get cleared up. Okay, obviously the, we needed to clear this. Let me see. 
So as I'm doing that, I'll be wiring the board here. Okay, so it built successfully. Now I'm going to um, connect it over SWD. Let's provide flash erase. Um, let's see. Does this work? No, hold on. Bear with me for a sec, please. There you go. Okay, so we have the board here. Um, let me see. Let me clear it here as well. There you go. So uh, we have here the shell interface. I'm, I'm pressing tab here, as you can see. It's working as if we had it wired over USB or UART. And we can do many interesting things. Let me see what, uh, what we can do that could draw your attention. Um, first use case, for instance, if you want to do it like a board bring up or something, you can do a night square C scan. We have a bunch of devices in, a, in the bus. So as you can see here, you can see one, two, three, four, devices on the I2C bus. That would be a nice way to say, hey, are these properly powered? Can I uh, actually talk to them? Right? That's one of the things. Um, additionally, we can uh, issue the LED command. So it's got the ability to set on an LED. So let me see if this works. OK, I'm not sure if it's visible, but there's like a red LED on. I can turn it off. As simple as that. If you have support for your specific LED, meaning if you have like a, a charge pump that had talks over I2C and there's driver support for it and you enable it, you can use just this shell command to talk to it. Um, and let's to do, let's play with the sensors. Um, additionally, for instance, let's say sensor. So uh, before I go into that, you can use this very useful command. So this concept of devices in Zephyr is everything that's uh, kind of like a driver that uh, has a purpose. So this includes, um, as you guys can see, LEDs, the ad square C device, the bus, um, among other things like this, the individual sensors. We have the APAS 9960, the uh, light sensor. We have the LIS 3DHS, uh, 3DH, uh, the accelerometer, and among other things. So you can have like an idea of whether that device was initialized properly or not. And the, the way to know that is if it's if it says ready, it was successfully initialized. Uh, otherwise, it would say disabled. And this time, I don't think there's anything that's disabled, but that will be one interesting way to see, hey, this, did this, was this initialized uh, properly? Finally, let's, uh, for instance, let's get some data. So if we wanted to say, for instance, we want to say orientation. I'm going to copy paste this, hopefully. Well, I, it turns out I don't need to. So here, for instance, um, the XMR positive axis here in this case is Z. So if I issue this command, I'm going to see that, obviously, this is the units for this is meters uh, per uh, squared uh, seconds. So right side up, 9.8-ish meters per square second. As you guys can see, that's the case. I'm moving it, so obviously, it may be changing. I'm going to flip it, so phasing down. We should see minus that, right? We can see that's the case. Same thing with this. Let me see what's the axis. So this is x positive, this direction. That's the case. I flip it, and we see it. So it appears to be working. Let's see another sensor that we may find interesting. Let's see the light sensor. So you have like the, first you have proximity light, uh, ambient light, and RGB components of it. So in this case, this is subject to the light of the room. I'm going to cover it right now. Hopefully, you can do it one handed. And as you can see, the values drop down. So it appears to be working. Additionally, the proximity seems to be saturated, I believe, 255. That will tell me that, hey, it's in close proximity to this. Um, let me see what other this case. Let me see. Hmm. LPS 22, I think that gives you ambient temperature and pressure. So. It's around 24C. I believe at least the board believes that's the case, and the pressure seems sane, um, kilopascals. Let me see what other things we can do. I believe, uh, oh, so uh, additionally to this, you can 
um, not only with shell, but also you can uh, uh, route other subsystems. In this case, we have both shell and the, and the locking subsystem piped through this, as you can, as you guys could see in the beginning. So you could do a lock test, for instance, start. Oh, demo. So right now, you're just like generating locks, and they're being transferred Bluetooth LE, and the computer is picking them up. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I'm able to stop it. Log test. Stop. Did it not stop? OK, well, there you go. <laughs> it took a little bit of time. Uh, this is using deferred logging, so it is not blocking the execution of your, your uh, application. So it's just like putting them on the buffer and low priority thread. And when it ever gets time, it's just puts, putting them out. So this will not severely compromise your application. Obviously, there is some overhead that should be considered. Uh, OK, so I guess um, coming back to this, I believe. Um, that leaves us around 10 minutes for questions. Um, let me turn this off. <laughs> um, by the way, I have this board uh, that I'm, I have a few for a giveaway. So if you're interested, just reach out and probably I have some for you. Um, thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes. Does this work, perhaps? Let's see. Here you are. Right. OK. By the way, I don't know if the microphone's working, but I, I did get your question. Um, so the throughput considerations, what, what, does, what does that, um, what's the implication for sort of Bluetooth? Certainly, uh, and that, that's something that probably I should have mentioned, is that when you're going with shell Bluetooth, you're not really caring about throughput performance. This is improved flexibility. Because literally what you're, well, in this case, for shell, right? Um, not for um, news in general. For shell, you're just like, putting characters out, like ASCII characters, UTF characters. And obviously, that may not be the best for your application. Um, you may want to go a different route if you wanted to optimize for it. So I haven't characterized it, but that's generally not what, in principle, this is for. This is in pro of small commands, a lot of flexibility. So a typical use case would be, what if I wanted to implement uh, a CLI, or I have a set of commands for provisioning the board, the, the, your device, um, exercising some of the sensors, and you don't want to have to change the, the GAD database every time you want to add new functionality on it, because that's something that's uh, just a, it's moving, it's a moving target. You are coming up with new requirements. You want to uh, do new things. So instead of just restructuring what the GAD database is supposed to be, you just add a new command, and it's going to be recognizable. And Obviously, just uh, making, making it on top of shell makes it really easy so that you don't have to parse the new command. You don't have you just put the function handler you specified in that standardized manner. Uh, what, what are the arguments and what are your expectations? And that's the way you work it. And at least that's how Croxel has used it in the past. But that's a good question. Carlos. Thanks. So I was wondering whether you tested multiple of the or several of the clients that are available out there whether you have recommendations uh, which clients to use so um, I don't have a particular recommendation I would say um, there I mean if you if you just like Google news client you'll find a ton of them particularly the one that this Bluetooth CLI has come up with it uses I don't I don't recall specifically, but it's, it generally there's like a ton of support for that. So unfortunately, I don't have a particular recommendation, but I can tell you that there's a ton of them. I believe Nordic has like some open source implementations that you can leverage for them. Obviously, they developed it, they maintain it. Uh, but yeah, that's the case. Um, I'm sure you won't have a hard time finding support or for what you're trying to do. And the follow-up, thanks. Yeah. And the follow-up, the one you were using was using then the built-in Bluetooth from your MacBook, or uh, did you have another board? Yes, okay. it's the built-in from the MacBook. Um, I would assume, depending on the limitations, it may or may not work. In this case, I didn't need an external Bluetooth controller. 
or anything, but that right. could perfectly be the case as well, generally, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I'll, I, on top of that, I can say at least I've used it on Linux, uh, Mac OS, and I don't think I've tried it on Linux, uh, on, on Windows. Um, I guess if you, I don't know, that's the only thing I, I haven't tried. Any other questions? Uh, who, who had their hand up? <laughs> okay, he had his hand up. <laughs> yeah, uh, just curious, uh, have you tested multiple instances of this? It just occurred to me when you were doing the login test that right. you could potentially have logging going over a different Yes, connection. yes, I, I've tried it, even though I haven't stress tested it. Um, obviously, in the end, even though you have different endpoints, right, it's the same protocol. You're still exchanging packets every so often in the connection interval would not. So there are definitely limitations on that. Um, one typical sample that I did, essentially, I had like the console routed over one end and the shell on the other one. So obviously, the throughput required for the shell is not that much if you're not like doing extensive commands exchanged uh, automatically. I generally just like type the uh, like uh, help or something and then on the other end the other end the the, the console was just out putting message. So I, I did I, I have tried it. It does work. Uh, although I don't know what the throughput limitations for that are. With the client you're using, how do you select which one to connect to? So in this case it's this very limited implementation. It's open source so you can check it out and improve it a lot better. But essentially the way you would tie those things is by the attribute handle. So even though they they're the same service you may tie them by, hey, this is the, your application. You say the first instance of this service, it's meant for this purpose, and the second one would be for that, and that's how you would tie those uh, things together. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Um, is there a Linux implementation of news as well, of the server side, or if not, have you considered uh, contributing? On the server to side, um, well, this is on Zephyr. <laughs> I, yeah, so um, no, I, this was meant for particularly my needs and what my applications uh, were needing, which was a flexible CLI over Bluetooth. I said, hey, Shell is already there and we reuse it for USB. Why not using it over BLE as well? I, I don't think if there are no implementations, would be a nice follow up on that. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks for your question. I, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for it. It's, uh, um, one last uh, remark. I don't know. Uh, do we have any comments or, or questions on? Uh, no, we've, we're having troubles with the technical game. <laughs> okay. through, so if, if there's anyone that wants to ask questions, please use the um, ZDS-24 in Discord. If, and I'll, I'll just go check that right now. But I think we're pretty much out. So Right. Yeah, um, look, look in Discord afterwards. And if maybe if there's some questions tagged to you, good. Yeah. then we can answer them there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Tag me at, at Ubieda, and probably I'll be able to answer your question. Um, one thing I, I, I didn't mention in the presentation, and since you guys haven't asked us, like, what are the security implications of this, right? <laughs> you have shell over Bluetooth LE, and it's accessible everywhere. Anybody can pull up a phone and interact with it, right? Big disclaimer, you should use, uh, you, you should not use this way, just like in your application, and then go to production with it. You definitely should use authentication and any validations. There are ways that you can have like dynamic shell commands, so you could like hide them be uh, behind a specific state, or just like require authentication. Moreover, you can use like the BLE uh, encryption and authentication procedures that uh, are there already supported. So, please do your due diligence to understand what are your implications of just enabling this. Just please don't go ahead and enable this uh, and put it put your products out in the field, and it's great to uh, implement it because. People will easily interact with it. It's pretty intuitive. Anybody can just type a tab and it'll come up with a few characters that are human readable. So <laughs> just that, uh, that comment. Well, if there's no more questions, we'll say thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for your time.